Well, good afternoon, everybody, to everybody in the room and to everybody joining us online. Welcome to this special discussion on the future of European Union enlargement. My name is John O'Brennan, and I'm a professor at Maynooth University, specializing in enlargement policy. And it's a great pleasure to be asked to chair this session today. Just before we begin, uh, this is part of the Institute's uh, Future Proofing Europe project. And we want to sincerely thank our colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs for the support that they provide for this project and for others associated with the Institute. We're delighted today to be joined by Lawrence Meredith, Director for Neighborhood East and Institution Building in DG Near in the European Commission. We're very grateful that Lawrence has given us his time and uh, the benefit of his extraordinary experience within the Western Balkans and within the Eastern Partnership uh, countries over very many years. Some of you will know that this is in fact the third in a very busy series this week. Uh, I've seen some of you more than I've seen my own family recently, uh, which is never a bad thing, you might argue. On Tuesday, the Institute hosted the Swedish Minister for European Affairs and Nordic Cooperation, Jessica Roswell. And yesterday, we had the Irish Minister for State for European Affairs and Defence, Peter Burke, who offered an Irish perspective on the topic. So we've had a very interesting range of member state perspectives on uh, enlargement. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Lawrence is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. We will then have significant time for questions and answers, both from the floor and questions directed online. If you are online, we would ask that you use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, and we will direct those questions then towards uh, Lawrence. Now, I don't think I need to um, reiterate too much the fact that EU enlargement has come back onto the agenda in a very serious way this year. We're meeting today, I think, at a very important juncture because it rests between the point where the Commission produced its annual progress reports on the candidate states some weeks ago and before potentially critical decisions are taken by the European Council in December. There's also been a huge amount of activity this year with think tanks and uh, policy institutes producing lots of different papers on enlargement and trying to scope out what it means both for the European Union and for candidate states and aspiring states. The Franco-German paper, for example, from uh, mid-September um, was a very, very interesting one and it's elicited a lot of comment. I very much look forward to hearing what Lawrence has to say. He has been director for Neighborhood East and Institution Building in DG Near in the Commission since December 2015. It's great to be able to welcome him back to Dublin. We last met at government buildings in 2018 when there was a symposium on the Eastern Partnership and its development and evolution. Lawrence previously had been head of strategy in DG Near and led work on the European Neighborhood Policy Review. He worked previously for 10 years on the enlargement portfolio um, uh, in different roles. So he has really deep experience in exactly the regions that are gravitating closer to the European Union through the accession process. So with no further ado, it's a great pleasure to ask Lawrence to address our audience. Lawrence, thank you. Well, many thanks, John, for that very warm uh, welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, back here in Dublin and uh, especially here in this institute, this distinguished body with uh, so many of you here, both in the room and online. Um, I fully agree with everything that you've said and what I thought I could do today um, after you've heard the views from both Sweden and Ireland is 
uh, set out how we see it from the European Commission. Um, as you said, I've actually been in this field for, for, for 17 years. That goes all the way back uh, before um, Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia joined. I've seen quite a number of evolutions in enlargement policy and, and, and contributed to, to, to some of them on the way. And so um, I think President von der Leyen put it very clearly in her recent State of the Union speech by saying, calling on all European citizens uh, to, to hear the call of history. And uh, nobody wanted to find ourselves uh, in this situation of Russia's brutal, illegal um, invasion of Ukraine for over 18 months, um, such brutality that has changed the whole geopolitical context. Um, but I think um, the president's been quite clear that this is a moment where the Ukrainians, first and foremost, have stood up and responded and showed how important for them being part of the European family is. And uh, I worked on Ukraine from 2000 to 2004 very closely. Um, and I, I think it's simply staggering uh, how fast they have managed to reform on so many areas. And that in a time of war. Uh, but I also think that the impact that this war has had, which is in itself tragic, has also put us in a different um, geopolitical context. And I think you see the speed with which governments in Moldova and Georgia have taken on the challenge of reforming um, some really challenging areas, rule of law, democracy, human rights, uh, independent media. And I think it's been a catalyst for reforms also in the Western Balkans who've seen what's been happening and have uh, seen the need to accelerate their own paths towards Europe. And that's why uh, I think you can say very clearly, and I'm sure you heard that from both ministers earlier this week, uh, that there's a, a renewed momentum in the enlargement uh, process, the first time in almost 20 years that there has been a package presented for 10 countries. And I think one thing I remember from being part of the processes before is that really gen generates a healthy competition uh, between these countries that people look across at what the neighbors are doing and whether these reforms are progressing in the right way. They get good ideas. Um, and I think that that can only uh, enrich the process. And I, I completely agree, John, that uh, this was the timing I had hoped to be able to come to Dublin and address you because I think it's when uh, we have the most interesting debate. You rightly said the proposals are on the table, uh, but we've still got a month uh, or just less than a month before uh, the, the European Council leaders will take groundbreaking decisions. Uh, I don't know what decisions they will take. You know what the um, Commission's recommendations are, and I'm going to say, of course, a few words about that. Um, but I think it's a really, really important moment and probably in many ways, certainly as regards enlargement, the biggest European Council in approaching 20 years. Um, so um, that's why I'm going to start by talking about the countries themselves, and then perhaps we talk about the process uh, at the end of that. Let's start most obviously uh, with Ukraine, uh, where um, uh, we had uh, called in our opinion on their application uh, for membership for them to address seven steps. And um, uh, we, I think it's really important to underline that this is a merits-based process. There is no fast track. Um, this is all about what reforms have been delivered on the ground. And as an EU official in enlargement for many years, uh, I've always underlined with my teams, our credibility, the credibility of the European Union depends fundamentally on an accurate portrayal. And that's so important because the countries themselves know where they stand. Uh, all EU member states have ambassadors or representatives who are reporting to them. So it's really important that we have an accurate picture of what's going on. And I think, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, Ukraine has really stepped up and driven reform at a remarkable pace. And that's been the basis for the Commission's recommendation uh, for the Council to both open uh, accession negotiations with Ukraine uh, and also to adopt uh, negotiating frameworks once a number of further steps have been taken. And in a similar vein, um, I was actually in Moldova with Minister Peter Burke uh, only a month ago, and um, we were at the Moldova support platform together. 
and we, we heard addresses from uh, President Sandu, Prime Minister Rechan, and Foreign Minister Popescu. And uh, again, you could really sense the vigor with which the Moldovans are uh, driving forward reforms. And again, it's the, the same main areas of rule of law, of course, big debates on issues like de oligarchization. I'm sure we'll come back to that when we get to questions and answers. Uh, but we see that out of the nine steps that they were asked to say, they've made very, very substantial progress. And that's why, again, the Commission is recommending opening uh, accession negotiations with Moldova. And again, that uh, the Council would adopt a negotiating framework once Moldova has taken a number of additional steps. And we can talk about uh, what those steps are and how they, uh, perhaps when we get to the questions. Let me turn to Georgia, where I was asked uh, by our Commissioner to uh, present the package in the light of the adoption. I was in Tbilisi. Uh, just after the recommendation had been made. And I have to say uh, that in the eight years I've been in this position, uh, I've never experienced such an atmosphere. There was um, euphoria and uh, waving of European flags on the streets of Tbilisi. And I'd ask you to reflect on in how many places you see uh, such vibrant waving of European Union flags and um, I also had discussions both with civil society and the leaders of all political parties represented in the parliament. And again, um, definitely one of the issues we've talked about in the lead up to our report was uh, polarization, the need to tackle this. And I have to say in the eight years I've been there, I've not seen such a consensual discussion. Of course, there were differences of opinion. It's natural, it's, it's the nature of things that political parties differ on how things should be done but there was unanimity that they felt that um, uh, they welcomed the commission's recommendation and they really really call on the all the eu member states to support uh, the recommendation to grant candidate status to georgia also of course on the understanding that the remaining steps and priorities are addressed and here i'd like to talk about a couple of the issues that we've identified which is uh, foreign interference and information and manipulation alignment with cfsp these are important issues. Um, this is about joining the European Union uh, means taking on EU values. That's in the treaty. And I think these are issues that in this geopolitical context are all the more important than they've ever been uh, before. Um, I'm going to turn to the Western Balkans and I'm going to start with Bosnia and Herzegovina because the Commission has also recommended the opening of EU accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina once the necessary degree of compliance with the membership criteria is achieved. We see progress on several fronts. We also call on Bosnia and Herzegovina to fulfill the 14 key priorities that are set out in the Commission's opinion on their membership application. And we, you can see uh, the evidence that we put in our report and, you know, for me, this process is always about the people of these countries. And this is really a significant message of encouragement to the people of Bosnia, Herzegovina, who have faced, as we know, many challenges over the year. But it's also a call on the authorities to take their responsibilities and to accelerate reforms on these areas. This brings me to talk about Albania and North Macedonia, where the screening process for which I'm actually responsible under my institution building hat is advancing um, smoothly and swiftly, which is really important. And there, I think the, the main uh, opportunity that uh, is on the table is to open the first cluster, the fundamentals, ideally by the end of this year. And that's for the authorities to deliver on these key areas we keep talking about, rule of law in particular. And um, then let me come to uh, Kosovo and Serbia, an issue, as John said, that I worked on in depth for a number of years uh, uh, when the very first dialogue was started um, all those years ago. And I think um, the EU has been really clear that normalization is part of the process. And it, it's uh, imperative on both sides to take the steps to address this. We've seen uh, tension this year, we've seen setbacks, and I think it's really important that both sides uh, address those issues. Uh, and that will be an important element uh, in uh, their path towards the European Union. And so um, Montenegro, we do welcome the formation um, of a government that is sending signals that it's 
very interested in the uh, uh, progress towards the European Union. And um, of course, their progress will depend on meeting the interim benchmarks set in the famous rule of law chapters 23 and 24. And that's key to the overall speed of progress. I, I, I would also like to flag um, uh, the growth plan. Um, that's an innovation, put 6 billion euros on the table, 2 billion in grants, 4 billion in loans. It's very, very substantial. It's got four pillars. Um, firstly, uh, deeper integration with the European Union single market, which is, of course, the foundation of the membership uh, that lies ahead. Secondly, and this has been a challenge in the Western Balkans, regional economic integration. This really needs to accelerate. And I know there are others in this room who know the region even better than I do. And I'm sure you'd agree that this has been often a frustrating challenge to get the economic opportunities to their full advantage. Um, I, we really call on the governments to take this opportunity. Uh, there's uh, substantial incentives on the table now. And thirdly, of course, um, once again, the growth plan you know, business environment is again about rule of law, democracy, um, reliability and predictability. And so these elements will be the third pillar of the growth plan. Uh, and fourthly, of course, the incentives of the um, financial support uh, itself. So all these three issues um, come with the incentives of this six billion growth plan. Um, we believe this is a really substantial new element that in a moment where the Western Balkans is looking at what's happening in other parts of the world, we've talked about Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, um, there are strong incentives on the table in the new growth plan for the Western Balkans to help them accelerate their reforms towards the European Union. Um, and of course, uh, Turkey is a candidate country and a key partner for the European Union, but the accession negotiations remain at a standstill um, and it's... Um, imperative on, on them to take uh, the, the, the steps to address uh, these issues. So I'd um, like to talk finally about what does all this mean? This is a future proofing. What does this mean for the existing European Union member states? Uh, I've been discussing this in my bilateral meetings here in Dublin with different departments. And of course, I think the president's been very clear that right now, uh, work starts following her State of the Union speech from next year on policy reviews that will look uh, at all aspects of what that implies for a, a future European Union. And um, let's be very clear on the rules of the game. Your enlargement is an intergovernmental process, as you all know very well. It, uh, decisions are taken by unanimity. And that means that um, future member states will only join once the existing European Union member states can agree on how that can be done. And, uh, but we cannot wait for the process to reach its end point before we start the thinking. The thinking starts now, and that's what we're here to discuss. I'm sure we will have a lively uh, debate, uh, but I think it's quite right. Of course, what are the challenges? I mean, uh, speaking here in Ireland and reflecting the discussions I've been listening to here in the different departments, of course, um, the budget, um, the institutional mechanisms, um, how will uh, the changes be achieved? I've heard views expressed on whether a treaty change could be required, and I hear um, uh, the strong reservations expressed here about that. And I think, you know, every member state has its view. Uh, the EU, as it should and always does, will listen to each and every view, and we need to find a way forward. Agriculture is always a major element uh, when we talk about the budget. Uh, but I would, to, to this audience, I would say um, we've done it before. Uh, we did it with the big enlargement in 2004. We did it with big countries, uh, Poland, Romania. They're now on the inside as member states. They have their own interests in the same sector. So I think this will be a key element of the future negotiations and uh, it will be definitely uh, challenging discussions, I'm sure. Uh, it always is, but um, up to now, we've always found solutions. And I think uh, the essence of the European Union is we're stronger together. That's the pull that the European Union has for all these countries we're discussing today. And I think that um, the EU is more than capable, as the President von der Leyen says, of answering the call of history and taking steps to complete our union.
Thank you very much. And uh, I'll take a seat if that's all right. And um, I'll be delighted to answer your questions. Well, thanks very much indeed, Lawrence, for that very comprehensive and I would say hopeful analysis of where we might be going with further enlargement. Can I begin by asking a question about the rule of law and the link between the rule of law and how it functions within the European Union and the cluster of fundamentals within the enlargement process? Because it seems to me there's a potential contradiction if the EU is not seriously enough pursuing rule of law abuses or transgressions within its jurisdiction, it becomes more difficult to say to elites in Albania, in Bosnia, anywhere else, that these are the rule of law reforms that you must implement before you can join. Now, there has been, I think many people would argue, progress in tackling a lot of the abuses through different tools and mechanisms, but do you see a linkage between the two? And is it something that within the capitals of the candidate and aspiring states that comes up, that they talk about hypocrisy or you know, they can point to things within the union that are deficient, to say the least, that they're being held in a way to a higher standard? Thanks uh, uh, very much, John. And I, I think that uh, I don't know how many times I use the phrase rule of law in my opening remarks, but I think it's very much at the heart of today's enlargement process. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, this is something that we've learned through experience, through experience I've lived through. And, um, uh, you know, the European Union is constantly evolving and, and people say, uh, are we changing the goalposts? Um, well, the very simple answer is that the European Union is changing and therefore the goalposts reflect where the European Union is today and will be tomorrow and that's not where it was 10 years ago 20 years ago so I think the first point to be really clear is yes any future member state will not only be expected to meet the standards of today 2023 but the standards that we will have put in place by whenever they will join and that's I think it's important to be clear on this sometimes there are misunderstandings uh, that is the case. Uh, yes, it's challenging. Yes, it means that even when we're doing the screening, I talked about screening uh, right now for Albania, North Macedonia. I'm sure it'll be an issue uh, if the council takes a decision to open accession negotiations, for example, with Ukraine and Moldova. There'll be uh, um, uh, a strong desire to advance quickly again with screening. But when we will have done the screening, that will be the photograph of then. And as the process evolves, these countries and the European Commission will have a responsibility to um, help those countries meet the new criteria as they develop. And I think there are strong incentives on the table. Uh, there's the Ukraine facility in prospect, not yet fully decided, but there is also the growth plan, which has been announced, 6 billion, of which one of the key pillars is the fundamentals for the Western Balkans. So there's a lot of help. And yes, I do think that the... Um, President von der Leyen, since she took up office, has been crystal clear she wants a Europe of values. It's one of her um, political guidelines and 10 priorities. And um, in that time, we've really moved forward with the rule of law reports in the European Union. And we've made it clear that from next year onwards, we'll be doing an assessment as to which countries we would open the rule of law reports also to these countries. So I think it's robustly clear that... Um, uh, and I think that that is uh, one of the key factors that the people of these countries, be it of the Western Balkans or Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, uh, really want is a uh, uh, more effective rule of law in their own countries. Mm. Thank you. That, that brings me to a question about public opinion and civil society. I was interested in what you said about your trip to Tbilisi and the huge popular support that there exists there for membership. But one of the criticisms of the EU in the enlargement process over the years is that it didn't really work effectively enough with civil society, that the process has been kind of elite led for very understandable reasons. Governments have to be the key actors. But if you look at what happened in Poland, the mobilization of civil society there before the election was extraordinary. And it leads some to argue that 
the EU and the Commission should be more proactive in working with civil society groups on the ground in candidate states. Well, thanks, John. Uh, that's a very uh, good point. And uh, if you look at what we've said uh, last year in our opinions on Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, for the first time we made it explicit that engagement with civil society was one of the priorities that we wanted them to address. That's the first time that's been put so clearly black on white. And I think that reflects a realization of what you say is, is completely correct. In my almost 20 years experience in this business, the speed with which a country moves towards the European Union reflects the consensus in that country. So if you see a country, let's take Georgia again as the example, where over 80% of people in consistent surveying over the eight years, it's ranged between, I think, 75 and 85% over the entire period I've uh, been a director. Um, I mean, that shows a groundswell of popular opinion in any a uh, political leader needs to take that into account. I give the example of Georgia, I could have given other countries. Um, and I think uh, another thing I'd like to say is in, in the time I've been working there, and I'm thinking in particular of engaging with our former Deputy Director General Katerina Maternova, now the EU Ambassador uh, in Kiev. And uh, one of the things I learned with her is that she really transformed mm. how the European Union is engaging with civil society in these countries. And our motto was, it's, it's not enough for governments just to hear civil society. You have to actually change things. There's no point. We're well beyond, yeah, let's have a meeting, tick the box. We've seen civil society. We're going to do our proposals anyway. That's not at all what the European Union has in mind. What we have in mind is we've a, a solid process of consultation, and the original proposals are changed, not all of them, not to every aspect, but at least demonstrable change between what the government of the day thought they might want to put on the table because they've heard the views of civil society. So, and, and I'd like to also make another point about, um, uh, uh, let's say, the will of the people. This is not just about what's the dynamic in the countries applying to join the European Union, and that's why I'm here in Dublin uh, and in Ireland. This is about making sure that the people across the existing members of the European Union see why it's also in their interests that enlargement takes place. And I think this is a really important part. That's why I was so delighted to have the opportunity and the invitation of the Institute to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, questions from our audience, both here in the room and online. So if you would like to put a question to Lawrence, um, please raise your hand and you might just tell us your name and your affiliation. Before I do, Stephen, with apologies, I'll come back to you in a moment. There is a question online from uh, General Jarrah Hearn, who's a retired Brigadier General and a member of the Institute. He asks, do you think that the normalization process for Kosovo, uh, for Kosovo Serbs, entails their capitulation to uneven political and civic dominance by Kosovo Albanians. Now, I come at that issue differently. Um, there have been very worrying developments in the relationship between the two uh, in recent months. We saw a paramilitary raid into northern Kosovo uh, in September, and there does seem still, what are we, 10 or 11 years on from the agreement that you and yeah. your colleagues worked on to be just this great distance between the two and that rapprochement just isn't happening. So I wonder if you talk about that because you have such extraordinary experience with Serbia-Kosovo relations and whether there is a genuine prospect for solving that problem. Well, um, thank you very much, both the Brigadier General for his question and, and, and for your uh, remarks as well. It's true that I know both Kosovo and Serbia uh, well from uh, working on that from uh, 2006 to, um, uh, to 2015 and uh, through an extraordinary period of development. Um, I think the European Union and all the member states have been really, really clear that normalization is essential on the path towards the European Union. We have a very high level EU a special representative uh, leading the process with strong support from the uh, high representative vice president. And um, 
Uh, and yes, you're right. There, there's definitely, I referred to it in my opening remarks, there, are, there, there is right now, this year, there has been tension in both directions. And I'd like to come back to the point I made about enlargement more generally. Uh, the, the speed of progress depends on the consensus, and that can be uh, an expression of the will of the people. I am sure that the people, both of Serbia and of Kosovo, want uh, membership of the European Union. They expect from their leadership. Of course, that doesn't mean that even the people or the leaders expect every aspect. Compromise on both sides is always difficult, but it is essential that there is progress on normalization for, uh, and I think that is something that the people expect. I do hope, uh, I mean, there's a political dimension to this, but I do believe that the growth plan on the table uh, offers immense new opportunities to incentivize reform because in compromise, uh, there are often people who perceive that they lose out. I'm not saying that all these aspects can be addressed by financial support alone. I do believe the political process is key, but I do think that with the additional massive support that the growth plan offers, that can that can trigger, um, uh, hopefully, a clear return to consensus building, which is imperative for progress on this issue. On that very point about the um, new subvention, um, it seems to me that not just in the Western Balkans, but I see this in the relationship between Bulgaria and Romania, where I think there are still only three bridges across the Danube. It has been very difficult to develop regional cooperation. And I get the sense sometimes in the Western Balkans that it's an either or the way it's actually perceived by people. And if they do invest a lot in embracing regional cooperation, it might be at the expense of their EU membership trajectory. Um, I just wonder, do you see evidence that there is a sort of change there and people are beginning to understand the value of that kind of regional cross-border uh, interstate economic cooperation as a vehicle, not just for taking all of the states towards the EU, but solving some of those issues about identity and so on. Um, well, thank you. I think that if you ask the question, do people want better connectivity in the Western Balkans? It's a really simple answer. Absolutely, yes. Then, of course, you ask individual countries, um, well, how should we achieve this? And I've worked on this um, with uh, for a number of years, and and then you get different views from different partners, and that's normal. It's a little, it's a different context, but yes, again, we're talking about compromise. There are different ways you could enhance the connectivity of the Western Balkans. I think the European Union, together with the governments, have been clear on the plan. For example, the TENS network, trans-European networks, uh, it is an uh, internationally agreed approach. Uh, now we need to uh, not just put our money where our mouth is. There is money on the table, so money will not be the sole factor. It's about political agreement on the way forward. It's about sequencing, and we have to start somewhere. And, and I, I think, again, this is something people really want. Um, you know, to go to a region I'm working on uh, right now, the Caucasus, um, we're talking about a Black Sea undersea cables, so both for electricity and digital. I think we're in a different different geostrategic context. I think such an idea, so ambitious, would have been unimaginable even three years ago. Now, I, not only is it unimaginable, it's almost unimaginable that we don't have such a plan because, um, and, and it's coming from both sides of the Caucasus. I've also been and Bucharest colleagues have been in Sofia, there's a strong desire. It's obvious that we need different sources of electricity. Yeah. Um, it's obvious that the renewable uh, potential in each of the three Caucasus countries uh, will be massively enhanced, not just enhanced. Why is it not happening anyway? Because where would they sell it to? There's a fixed domestic market. Look at the neighbours. Where do you sell it to? So you don't necessarily grow your thing if you can't sell the electricity. If, on the other hand, there were a cable under the sea, which is a long-term project, uh, but it's one that we need to make progress on and we're working on with a big international consortium, that's a game changer, not just for the three countries of the Caucasus, but for a number of uh, EU member states, 
and for the Western Balkans. So, I mean, energy is key as part of this geostrategic repositioning as well. Well, as somebody who spends a lot of time in the Black Sea, I heartily endorse that message, <laughs> I have to say. Um, we're going to take a first question from our audience in the room, Stephen. We will get a microphone. And just a reminder that this session is taking place on the record. Thank you. So thank you very much for, uh, my name is Stephen Day from Oita University, long way away in Japan. Um, thank you very much. It was really insightful and uh, um, inspiring talk. Um, I want to just pick up on, and you mentioned in, in the end of one of your uh, answers to John about uh, essentially about how we sell the idea of enlargement to all the existing EU member states publics. Um, because obviously, the, I guess there's no doubt that there will be certain political parties that will seek to use it as a wedge issue in, in future elections. So I just wonder if you could elaborate on you know, how it can be sold to existing member state publics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, great to see you. I'm, I'm flattered and honored that you've come from Oito. I uh, hope for you that it's not just for, for the pleasure of this conversation, but um, I'll do my best to make it uh, worthwhile, even if it were. Um, and um, and that's a fundamental question. And I, I, I think outreach is an important part of it. But that's the first and foremost the responsibility of each of the governments of the European Union. I, I really believe they need, and I think that's why I couldn't unfortunately be here myself, but one of my colleagues was re reporting on what Minister Peter Burke said here yesterday, but Irish uh, Ireland has always been at the forefront of enlargement, has spoken in favour, uh, recognised that there are real challenges. I think people um, want to hear an honest assessment of the road that lies ahead. Um, one should not just paint it as enlargement is uh, blue sky and green pastures. I do believe that that's the right direction. It's what the minister said, but there are definitely challenges on the road, but we have the capacity to address those. We've done it before and the European Union is stronger as a bigger uh, actor. Uh, this college, President von der Leyen, HRBB Burrell have been really clear, not only in saying that the European uh, Commission needs to be a better geopolitical actor, but in demonstrating it can be a better geopolitical actor. And I think, you know, uh, many thought that um, the EU would be divided by what happened in Ukraine. They thought that already in 2014. They definitely thought that what happened uh, in from 2022 onwards uh, would sooner or later result in splits. I remember um, numerous commentators, especially going back to the 2014 period, saying EU could never hold this. This is not going to work. Um, I, I like to come back to that because that is clearly and demonstrably not been the case. The EU is strongly and passionately united um, in uh, defense of Ukraine. Ukraine is led by its own actions and its own voluntarism to reform uh, and to resist and demonstrate its resilience. So I think people see that we're in a totally different uh, geopolitical context where um, the EU needs to stand up for its own values. This is about uh, democracy, rule of law, peace and security. And I think um, using the European peace facility when it was first put forward, I heard many say, no, what's the EU doing? Member states will never back it. And even if we adopt it, they'll never use it. And bang, you know, incredible. And people forget so quickly what was said by uh, the commentators. But I haven't forgotten that. And uh, this is, um, I mean, we regret that we found ourselves in a situation where it was needed to use it so urgently. But I was, uh, I think we can only be impressed that the EU is acting as a geopolitical uh, uh, player, and that is the future. So when you talk about what are the challenges, yes, of course, there are budgetary issues, but these will be addressed. Of course, there's a functioning of the EU issues, uh, although I'm not sure that's what uh, gets the uh, people on the streets most excited. I think it's the, the, the budget, the agriculture, what's, you know, will this affect our own livelihoods? And I think we have to be clear, there will be adjustments, but I, uh, in the longer run, you're talking about a bigger market. 
bigger opportunities. Uh, and uh, I, we have seen that the enlargement of 2004, yes, there were, uh, there were issues on the road, but on balance, clearly economically, the case is demonstrated that is the greater benefit of all, including first and foremost, the original EU member states, if I can put it that way, who have taken those economic opportunities and who've expanded their markets uh, and their prosperity. I keep making that point that if you travel regularly from Estonia down to Bulgaria, you can see the extraordinary material difference that enlargement has made. Uh, it is quite incredible. I don't think it's well enough understood here, perhaps, and in some other member states of the EU, just how much transformation has taken place. I want to just come to a question, uh, one online, and then I will come to Ambassador Zerbeshvili. Um, there's a question from Professor Maureen Yonker Kenny at Trinity College Dublin. She asks, how can the European Union address the challenge of its unanimity rule in respect of enlargement and blocking measures by member states at particular junctures? It's been widely reported in recent days that Hungary is going to object to um, you, oh, the opening of negotiations with Ukraine. And this leads me to reflect on other patterns of blockages, the Bulgarian um, blockage of North Macedonia, for example, which is entirely about culture, identity and history, for me has no place within the enlargement process. It's something that professors and others should slug it out over. But I, it has been a recurring feature of the enlargement process over the last decade or more, where member states who are on the inside, for whatever set of reasons, seek to block progress being made by candidate states. Do you want to just look ahead to the December European Council and even beyond that to see how can we move beyond that kind of obstructionism? Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, enlargement from its very first days um, has been an intergovernmental uh, process. It's been decision uh, by all member states acting uh, individually and together. And yes, I recognize uh, that that has presented uh, numerous challenges to the countries, but also as a, in all modesty, as a European Union official, it's presented us with quite a lot of challenges on the, on the path. We've looked as imaginatively as we can at how to address those issues, um, which, as you say, um, this is not, let's say, what... The, we had imagined when we set out the enlargement strategy, but the, the fact of the matter is, under the current rules, they, 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 we have to reach consensus. And um, yes, that does involve uh, lengthy discussions, debates, uh, sometimes not always compromise, and uh, that is difficult. But um, being a member of a club that works at 27 has its challenges, but we've just discussed, it has massive opportunities. So if you act as the European Union, you have uh, greater security, greater economic prosperity, but in a process which is ruled by unanimity, uh, you do have to reach a consensus. Now, I am sure that when we talk about the policy reviews and, and future proofing, which is the theme this institute has uh, very interestingly chosen uh, looking ahead. Uh, these issues are going to come to the fore. I cannot judge where the decisions will land, but I'm certain that that will be on the table mm -hmm. as part of the discussions. Yeah. Ambassador Zerbesh, please. Uh, thank you very much, John, for uh, for this opportunity. And of course, I wish to thank um, the Institute of International and European Affairs for this opportunity to give, that you provide to all of us all the time with the very excellent speakers where we can hear their views, and then we can have an uh, opportunity to uh, to participate in the Q&A session as well. And of course, I wish uh, to thank you very much, Lawrence, for your very long-standing friendship to the people of Georgia, to, uh, to Georgia. You are a very well-known person in Georgia, and uh, I can say that you are one of the best experts from Brussels who knows all the insights of the, of the Georgian internal and, uh, and, uh, and foreign politics. Uh, 
I wish to say is that, first of all, I'm very much delighted, not just myself, but we all are very much delighted that, that the, the, the last decision of the European Union to recommend the George to, to grant the the, uh, the, the candidate status uh, has been has been has been uh, done. It, it gives us uh, additional incentives uh, to fulfill the other reforms that uh, that should be done by by the government. And as it has been mentioned here very much uh, rightly, that the success is based on the consensus of the government. And the people, or, and, uh, or the civil society, in other words, and I, I, and I think that uh, Georgia is the the, the 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 good example where the government and the civil society are doing the same, driving the whole nation towards the European Union. In the on what you mentioned about the flags, the, the European Union flags, it just is it's not just a symbolism, but it but it brings, of course, the the is the the death of the mindset of the civil society, of the government, and of the people. So my first question, if I may, will be that, as we will hopefully that, that the decision will be done uh, by the end of by 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 mid of December, and Georgia will be granted finally with the current status, and it will give us the opportunity to catch up with our very friendly nations of Ukraine and Moldova. Will that will that will that uh, be something that you would consider that it it, it could be restored? The three your countries can be restored again. It will be the same basket uh, as we were before. Uh, that is my first question. And the second question will be that it has been mentioned here for a few times about what does it mean for those countries? I mean, the enlargement, what has been enlargement for those countries that are already the members of the European Union and how to sell to the members of the European Union the next enlargement. And it was absolutely rightly mentioned that there are a few dimensions. The political dimension is that, of course, I will be saying that is the the spread of the European values and the, and the democracy. This is number one. This is the best one that the European Union can do by spreading the democracy further to the eastern borders of the European continent that will bring the stability and security to the European uh, continent as it is. On the other hand, it is economic dimensions. And that's, uh, Lawrence, that you have mentioned about the cables under, uh, under uh, Alexi water cables uh, carrying energy uh, and, uh, and uh, fiber optic uh, cables. At the same time, it will provide additional uh, we'll say possibilities to diverse the crude and oil from the Caspian Basin. At the same time, it will link the European market with the quite rich and multiple economics of the Asian uh, world. This is not very well linked for now because Georgia serves as a good corridor connecting East and West. And of course, it's not just by land, but but by air as well. So my question will be in that, in that regard, would you think that this will be something that Georgia can contribute to the future of the European Union? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Didi Madlaba, thank you very much, uh, George. And um, let's start with your first point. When I uh, made my opening remarks, I talked about this being the first enlargement with 10 countries for almost 20 years. Uh, I believe that, and I'm sure that this will create uh, a renewed energy and dynamism in the enlargement process. And yes, our previous experiences showed that when you've got more countries uh, looking to join more examples more different ways of, of doing it right and perhaps not quite so good uh, you um this competition and uh, i can already sense uh, not just from what you said but from my own experiences traveling uh, moldova and georgia recently um that they're watching each other closely by the way uh, i know that in uh, tbilisi uh, a, a couple of weeks ago there was actually a meeting where they also invited um, uh, senior representatives from Western Balkan countries. Uh, so that shows that uh, this is becoming a broader community where they're cooperating, discussing, learning from each other, which I, as somebody who's director for institution building, can only wholeheartedly support and literally support in the sense that I have instruments that can facilitate that. Um, uh, that's healthy. Now, can they catch up? That's the responsibility of, of the Georgian authorities, first and foremost. And I've already made the point that it's pretty clear to me uh, that it's the will of the people. So <laughs> it's, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's an important event next year, and I'm sure that will be pretty uh, pretty determining 
uh, in, in that context as well. So, um, but the first step is uh, the will, there needs to be decisions taken. We, the Commission has just made its recommendations. It's for the European Union at 27 to take the decision. I think um, I'm not, uh, one should not count one's chickens. And uh, also, in the case of Georgia, we've been very clear uh, that there are a number of further steps that will need to be addressed um, to confirm uh, such a decision if it's taken. And I, I, I flagged already uh, the issues related to foreign interference and, and manipulation of information, CFSP alignment, uh, but there are other factors about ensuring a free and fair competitive electoral process, which will be key ahead of next year. I'm not going to list them all, uh, but uh, that's the first priority and step by step. And of course, then I think it's an admirable goal uh, uh, to catch up because that shows ambition in the reform process. But it's not just ambition, it's about delivery, of course. Yeah. Can Georgia contribute? Absolutely. Uh, I think Georgia's key. Um, uh, the geography of the region, which you know far better than I, is such that um, that is the entry point to the Caucasus if you come from the European Union. And um, uh, I'm really proud to have been, in a modest way, part of uh, our commissioner's vision, uh, together with the leaders of the region, both the Caucasus and the EU, uh, to see these ambitious projects move forwards. I've talked about the Black Sea uh, electricity cable. I uh, mentioned also the fiber optic cable. There's also ferries, a simple physical ferry that were discontinued for a couple of decades, then now started again. These are these are symbols that people recognize and use. You say you travel in the region, it yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. And a lot of the time I, I am forced to travel through Istanbul because it's the only way I can get from one city to another, which is deeply frustrating. I imagine for people in business as much as... I'm going to make a pitch uh, that I yeah. made in Tbilisi yeah. recently. Um, and it's not just about Georgia, it's for other countries. You know what? And this is not just selfish from John and me. Um, I actually said this to, um, to the Deputy Foreign Minister in, in Georgia recently. I said, experience shows that if you want to intensify your dialogue with the European Union, it's pretty basic and obvious you need direct flights. I remember there were direct flights around the time of visa liberalization, um, which, of which Georgia had benefited now for a number of years. I leave that thought with you. That's for others to decide, but it would be enormously helpful. I have a question online from Dan O'Brien, who is the chief economist with the Institute. And Dan's question is about media freedom, press freedom within the European Union and the enlargement landscape. He asks, what sort of thresholds for press freedom could trigger the Commission to intervene in a member state, and I presume in a candidate state as well, in which a government and or political parties seek to curb freedom of the press? There is deep concern, I think, Lawrence, about media capture, the capture of both public and private television, radio and newspapers, both within the EU and particularly in the Western Balkan states. And I just wonder about your view about how proactive potentially the Commission might be, because there's a lot of evidence to show in some states the media has been almost entirely captured by oligarchic forces or those that are close to the governing party or regime? Um, well, thanks to Dan for his question. Uh, I think this goes to the core of EU values anchored in the Treaty on the European Union and um, at the heart of the enlargement process, which put the relevant articles at the, at the center of the enlargement process, quite rightly. But it's not about articles in a treaty, it's about what people want. People want to hear a diversity of opinions and people have views on the direction of their own country, often of other countries, by the way. But I mean, they, uh, and in a, in a, a global world, a digital world, um, you know, access to information is in, has been completely transformed. I've got three teenage boys who are much more agile in this world than I am. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you see, uh, even in the tragic circumstance of the war in Ukraine, uh, is that me? Uh, in the war in Ukraine, you know, information is key. And therefore, um, independence of media is an essential criteria. And uh, this is, again, what we said in the steps. Look at what we've put in Ukraine. 
Moldova, Georgia. It's really clearly identified. It's always been an issue also in uh, in previous parts of the enlargement. But I think it's only we're only strengthening our attachment to freedom of media and making ever more explicit and clear, not just in the words of the report, which are the anchor, but in the political dialogue that our EU political leaders have. And here I'd like to make a point because uh, you say this is the third in a series and we've had ministers from Sweden and Ireland. I would also say that the strength of the European Union is when uh, EU leaders speak with one voice. So it's not just about the leadership of the European Union institutions, it's about EU ministers making these messages and underlining that this is the voice of 27 speaking to the uh, applicant countries, whichever they may be. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Valerie Hughes, who is a member of the Institute. Um, Valerie asks about the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, Dania Milatovic, and the recent warning in her report about war criminals returning to the former Yugoslavia as war heroes. We've seen some examples of that in recent times. Um, she mentions Russian support for Serb right-wing activists and organizations. Um, she also mentions Alicia Kearns, a very prominent conservative member of parliament in London, her statement about the appeasement of Belgrade being a problem. Um, what is the commission's view about this? And she underlines and connects this to President Zelensky's recent warning about the vulnerability of the Western Balkans to Russian penetration in particular. Um, well, as I've just said, we're in a rapidly transforming information space, which is global. Um, so um, the European Union, but also working uh, let me start from this angle. There's different aspects to the question. Um, the Council of Europe but, uh, is one of our key partners. When we put together a European Commission report, we consult all major international organizations who have views and access to information. This is definitely um, one of the persons and institutions with whom we work extremely closely. So this is, of course, the European Commission takes its own view um, but we, we take these as uh, elements of evidence into consideration when we set out our reports. That's the first point. And, and uh, that's a constant dialogue that we have, not only with the Council of Europe, but with other bodies, OSCE, ODEA. Um, and we talked about, for example, election processes. So it's really important that while there may not be EU a key, uh, formally speaking, there are broader European standards, and we refer to, we refer to those. In terms of... Um, foreign uh, interference and manipulation of uh, uh, information. I've already said that this is something, I mean, this was not an element uh, in the previous enlargements. This simply did not come on the table. I'm sure if one looks back in history, one could have discussed aspects about it, but um, it, it could not not be on the table now. And I think uh, in, I keep going on, but it, it's really fundamental. In this new geopolitical, geostrategic context, this is a reality. This needs to be addressed, and this is being expressed as a key issue. Look at what we put in the um, the next steps that these countries need to take. Um, this is, is, is fundamental. And um, ultimately, it comes back to espousing values. And I would also say it's about what the people want and if the people uh, of a country whichever it may be call strongly enough for their leadership to drive towards the european union um, it's never linear the progress uh, there will be steps forward steps backwards but it's the people who will hold the leadership accountable and i do believe that for whichever of these countries that their uh, that the process of going towards the uh, the, the, no, not the, the goal of EU membership is fundamental for the people, and the, that is what will mean that leaderships have been held to account. And we've seen it in previous enlargements that those uh, there have always been breaks or deviations or differences at different moments, but then it's the people who need to hold their leadership to account. Well, I'm very sorry that I have to bring this conversation to an end. I want to thank our colleagues at the Institute for hosting us, to Anna and Lorcan and their colleagues for all the logistical help in preparing, uh, to Jill and her colleagues for 
organizing this really interesting series of events. And to anybody who's just tuning in for this one, I highly recommend that you go back and watch Tuesday and Wednesday's events from our ministers, the Swedish and Irish ministers. I want to thank everybody who has viewed uh, online and everybody who has come to the Institute today for what's been, I think you'll agree, a really expansive and highly illuminating conversation led by Lawrence. So we really appreciate it, Lawrence. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome back in Dublin anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.